your gums and sound the attack. Oh, right. Hello, hello, hello. And welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the We Got the Chocolates podcast. In fact, this will be episode 27, I reckon. We uh, literally just pressed upload on episode 26, so that's out there and ready to go. And uh, 27 is a special one, has because essentially we've exhausted all of my contacts uh, and we started going through your contact list. So you're going to take over with the intro stuff here. Yeah, thanks, mate. Yeah, today we're fortunate enough to be able to speak to a player from a sport we probably don't talk about enough, seeing as though it's played all around the globe and has been a massive part of the sporting environment in Australia for uh, many years now. Uh, The sport I'm talking about is rugby union and it's probably one that none of us on the podcast here are really experts of. Uh, I played a few games for my school, Sheldon College, back in the day and was able to manage thanks to my league background, but certainly not up to date with the I've actually played one game as well, has just so you know. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, not up to date with the Wallabies and Super Rugby that well, but uh, the person we have the privilege to chat to today is Melbourne Rebels player and mate of mine. And Brad Wilkin. Brad, have we got you on the line, mate? Yeah, mate. I can hear you guys. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Great to hear. Magnificent, um, Brad. Oh, pleasure to have you. Can I just say, I just wanted to get my word count up early. Uh, thank you very much for being with us. And has uh, spoken very, very highly of you. And he's a great judge of character. So we've got no reason to uh, believe anything different. <laughs> Yeah, I think you might be right there. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, I should probably give some context to the listeners about how I know you um, and was able to convince you to come on the podcast, and thanks for doing that. So growing up, I probably would, never would have guessed you'd had the qualities to develop into a hard-hitting back roller in rugby because I knew you as the quiet, shy guy who chipped away as a little medium pacer on the cricket field who uh, could nudge the ball around for a few singles, I guess, with the bat in hand as well and as a teammate of mine for our local rep team, Bears. Do you remember those days? Yeah, yeah, mate. Vivid, vivid memories of the, the Bears cricket days. Um, <laughs> like you said, I, I was probably a little bit shy back in those days and I just... Uh, Swung the ball. I'd like to think I swung the ball a bit, mate. Not not just the medium pacer, but uh, <laughs> no, you certainly um, did. You certainly yeah, did. Yeah, but at which stage? Pretty average with the bat, I'd say. But at which stage did you obviously see the light and uh, and get yourself out of out of cricket and uh, over to a different sport? Oh, uh, yeah, it was probably about fifteen or sixteen. I think it was. I just with my fair skin complexion, I probably wasn't <laughs> suited to standing out in the sun. For how many how many hours it was? I used to wear I think long skins every time I I played. Just uh, yeah, definitely the the sun and the time on feet got to me a bit. And yeah, rugby was my calling. I think. Yeah, I think a few people struggle through that as well with the fair skin. Um, you. You, uh, you weren't our fast opening bowler who bowled searing bounces at the uh, opposition batters, but I, I was going to mention not only that you swing the ball, but I, I did rate you very highly back in the day and loved having you on the team because uh, you were just great at hitting a good length and swinging the new ball enough to build pressure from one end. Um, does your aggressive side come naturally to you or you know, uh, you have to play plenty of, uh, show plenty of mongrel on the footy field? So how does that go about? Um, yeah, I think I probably, as a, as a bloke, I'm... Yeah, not that aggressive or anything, but um, when it comes to competing in sport and uh, anything I do, I sort of like to like to get pretty pretty competitive, and I guess that aggressive nature comes out, um, especially on the rugby field. You you need that, otherwise you won't survive. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I think that's probably where I struggled back playing rugby league. I definitely <laughs> yeah, wasn't, has. didn't have enough mongrel. It's probably the least aggressive person that we know, apart from potentially Mitch, who's also sitting next to you and is vegan. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, I remember you rocking up to one of our under 13 Bears trials and no one knew who you were. And I think you went on to take about five for 11 in that game. Is that right? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think I got, got our, or our, I think it was Darcy Richardson out. He was the, he was one of the hot shot batters at the time, and I think I got him out a couple of times. So, um, just a fluke, I think. Just, just fluked a couple, and uh, found myself in a rep team for cricket, which uh, all good. So we, we, I guess, Lee asked at what point you did you decide cricket wasn't for you, and you said about that fifteen, sixteen. It, it wasn't after you were put on to open the bowling for the under fifteen mid east side, and uh, happened to bowl three wides in a row for your first three deliveries. Was it? <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> Yeah, this is uh, uh, it's a good story, but uh, I think you got it a bit wrong because 
it was two wides and then the next ball was middle stump. <laughs> oh, <laughs> don't worry. I didn't forget the wicket. I thought it was three wides and then the wicket, but I'll give you two. That's That sounds a bit better. So could, have, could have been three, but... Uh, no, no, I back uh, your memory more than that. Obviously, me. Brad's told the story a lot different to his mates over the years. <laughs> you've said it. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, and no, I constantly getting sprayed from my from my mates um, for that one as well. Oh, Toddy Dawson still gives me a bit, a bit of stick on that. Yeah, yeah, he might have been the one that mentioned it to me, actually. <laughs> um, <laughs> of course he did. <laughs> it, uh, it also wasn't after the time that I dominated you in backyard cricket, was it, that you decided to hang up the cricket boots? Yeah, look, that was, that was a tough day. I remember going over to your place and you, uh, you you definitely took advantage of the home ground and you were just flicking me off the, the fence to mid-wicket and calling four every every time. <laughs> it was about 20, 10 metres away. So. <laughs> knew all the, all the side rules that no one else knew about. Yeah, um, I, I, was, I was finding out new rules every ball I, I bowled and then, yeah, that one's four or... Yeah, Brad, Haz has actually been trying really, really hard over the last couple of weeks. Our, our last couple of podcast episodes have actually included quite a bit of garage cricket chat um, that we sort of play against in Marnus uh, in his garage and, and Haz has been dropping a lot of hints to try and get himself an invite to that. But I think after that story, we might, <laughs> we might tear up his invite, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, he wouldn't have the home what, ground advantage at least. What, what's the garage cricket chat? Uh, well, we sort of, uh, we basically have been trying over the last couple of weeks to get a little bit of seedings done in three facets of the game, batting, bowling, wicket keeping, uh, in terms of who sits where in the in sort of the top eight, uh, in terms of who's the best garage cricketer in our group of friends um, and has, unfortunately, hasn't, hasn't managed to make his debut in the Manus Labishkarkney garage cricket version. So he's been lacking in oh. votes. <laughs> Uh, fair enough. Uh, I think I think I would lose a few friendships over that. I'm pretty competitive <laughs> like you, Brad. Um, and I didn't actually remember yeah. that story of the backyard cricket, but uh, you did remind me recently, which might have been a bit of a mistake on your part because I won't forget it now. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, well, I was no surprise that you, you've gone on to the, the career you've had cricket so far. So <laughs> always knew, always knew you, were, you were pretty good, good talent. Oh, thanks, mate. Appreciate that. Um, and uh, you're quite a vocal supporter on social media of a mate of yours who's another one of those bowlers who isn't express pace but is very skillful with the ball in hand and swings it quite a bit, which is Chris Tremaine. Yeah, um, yeah. Chris is actually my my second cousin, so yeah, I got to got to support support him every now and then. Oh, that's outstanding. And he, uh, he got the better of us last yeah, night. That's right. <laughs> that was, there you go. That's Brisbane a talking Heat, point. Brisbane Heat played against him and the uh, Sydney Thunder, and unfortunately, Chris's team came out on top there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I was I was watching. Um, I was tuning in a little bit last night and saw that the thunder got up. Um, now, Brad, you probably know most of this information to be honest, given it's about your life. But uh, but I'll just sort of read uh, read this question just to to let the listeners know. Obviously, uh, we're talking about the fact that you probably ended up making the right decision uh, to to stick with Union as opposed to cricket, despite uh, but despite some of your monumental successes there that we've just highlighted. But obviously, your uh, performances in school rugby got you selected in the Australian schoolboys team in 2012 and 2013, uh, where you had a historic win actually over New Zealand in Auckland. Uh, you played club, club rugby for East and went on to compete for Australia at the 2015 Junior Rugby World Championships. Uh, and you were a part of the Brisbane City side that won the inaugural National Rugby Championship title. Uh, and although being in the Reds' elite development squad, uh, you moved down to Sydney to make your Super Rugby debut with the Waratahs. That was obviously who you were first contracted to. Uh, after being there in the 2017 and 18 seasons, um, in 2019, you then joined up with and play for the Melbourne Rebels now, obviously, and will be there again in the upcoming season. Now, have we sort of summarised that well? That's just obviously a basic Wikipedia search slash combined with Hazlitt's general knowledge, Brad. Have we gone all right there? Yeah, no, you've done very well. I think, I think you've nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> so perfect. So with the rebels, with the rebels again this year, obviously, mate. But you've uh, uh, you're actually originally from country New South Wales, aren't you? So that's why you were actually quite uh, aside from supporting uh, your second cousin Chris. You were quite happy to uh, vocally support the Sydney Thunder last night as well. Yeah, that's right. I was um, born up in Central West New South Wales before. I moved up to Brisbane, so yeah, you're right there. Yeah, and I guess, Brad, this this question always sort of across all codes of footy. I guess this is always quite interesting um, because of where you grew up and where you were uh, where you were from. Was it always an ambition of yours to play for the Waratahs one day, or 
or would would you really just have been open to whoever came knocking with the contract or were you quite a passionate sort of Waratah supporter as you were growing up? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I guess I left New South Wales when I was eight or nine. So my, my rugby career probably didn't really kick off until I got to high school. Um, and at the time, I grew up watching the Queensland Reds and that was sort of in there. Their prime prime years in 2010 and 2011, or especially 2011, when they won the, the premiership. And, yeah, I sort of grew up even wanting to play for Queensland Reds. But as, you know, my footy sort of played out, um, I got an opportunity to go down to play Australian Sevens in Sydney and sort of just evolved from there from being based from being in Sydney than the Waratahs. Um, and Brad, I was just going to continue with Hazard's biography that he's written here for us. Um, I know this is probably not a fantastic topic to talk about, but um, I understand you've been pretty unlucky over the years with some of your injuries. Um, and so Hazard's let us know that you spent sort of most of 2016 rehabbing from a torn right ACL and then, and then sort of just before you were going to make your return in 2017, you tore your left ACL. Um, and then again in 2019 to your right one, I believe. Is that is that correct? Yeah. Um, yeah, I've gone sort of right, left and right again. So Yeah, right. Yeah, so, like you sort of. So they're all, all pretty pretty major injuries. Yeah. I guess I just wanted to ask about your experience with that and how, how it's, you've sort of, I don't know, kept coming back, I suppose. I imagine it would be sort of pretty challenging playing your first game back each time. Yeah, yeah it was. Um, especially... especially after the first two, um, they were kind of pretty close to one another. So I'd, I'd probably only manage one or two games in between. Also, it was very rewarding, I guess, after eventually making my debut for the Waratahs after two ACLs. Um, it took a took a little while to get get the ball rolling again. Um, but I eventually got a whole season out of footy and came into the Rebels, my first season at the Rebels, feeling pretty good. Um, it was only until about round five or six that I got shot down again on my right side. So, yeah, yeah. it's pretty gutting. I I thought, and I, oh, I was just going to go hats off to you, Brad, because I've, I've had one ACL reconstruction and I found that, uh, like, oh, this is nine years down the track now. And when I, I guess this is what I would ask you about, like the, the mental challenges of it more so. Cause I, I don't know if this is the same for you, but definitely when I was coming back, like the doctor would keep saying to me, yeah, yeah, it's fine. Like it's probably stronger. It's stronger. It's stronger over the, like, the graph that they'd got. Uh, but just like mentally for me playing touch footy and trying to step off my right foot, I found it very, very difficult to do. And probably at times, like I still feel like even this many years down the track, it's actually quite difficult to put all my body weight on that leg in a game. So the fact that you've had to do that, that three times or certainly in the process of doing that a third time is uh, very much a testament to your your character no question about that yeah um yeah it's definitely a challenge like yeah in in terms of the mental side of things like I said it was was very challenging and obviously you've you've done your ACL before and you know that it, it's kind of getting back into your sport is quite challenging and I guess for me I, I just had to believe and back the process and my rehab, what I've done, the work that I've done. And every time I've gotten back, I've, I've been confident. Um, you know, my knee has probably been stronger than it was in the first place. It was just a, you know, wrong time, wrong place sort of incident that made it go again. But yeah, just having, having sort of belief in the, the process and also not worrying about the unknown, like, you don't know if it's going to go again or it may or may not, but you can't, you can only control what you can control. And if whatever happens, then you deal with it um, when it happens. But yeah, obviously just a lot of hard work trying to get it as strong as possible and yeah. controlling what you can control. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, I, yeah, that's an impressive attitude to have to it. And so how, how is your, your rehab coming along this time? Sort of where are you at in your, in your training and, and when can you, we expect to see you back out in the field? Yeah, so the rehab's going well. I'm probably over nine months now, um, which is quite a, quite a decent time for an ACL, just sort of giving it an extra bit of, um, bit of a love, I guess, just giving it a bit of extra time. So... <laughs> Um, maybe, maybe targeting a mid-February return. Um, 
I, don't, I haven't wanted to put a date on it, but um, I'm looking pretty good for those early rounds of Super Rugby, which is which is a great result. Um, I thought I thought I might not have gotten back this early, but it's definitely just the rehab has been going well. So yep. hopefully, fingers crossed, early uh, mid February. Because the season, be nice. this, Brad, the season starts in, in sort of like the end of January, doesn't it? So that really wouldn't be too many rounds in whatsoever. Uh, yeah, so we start start our first trial game pretty early and our first Super Rugby match is the 2nd of February. Yeah, okay. And uh, you're in your off-season at the moment. What else have you been doing in the off-season, Brad? Um, in my off-season, um, trying to, well, once the knee was uh, good and good to, to go, I was getting out and having a few hits of golf. Um, quite enjoy getting out there. and <laughs> it's, a, it's another way to sort of, I guess, switch off from rugby and, and training. Keeps the mind sort of busy. How's your golf go, Brad? Is it strong? Oh, very inconsistent, I would say. <laughs> uh, it's, um, it's a sport that you love and then you hate within seconds. So. Oh, yes. That is definitely I, I, our I, experience. I, 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 say I, I say I play it for my mental mental uh, escape, but it probably might give me a bit more grief than it does <laughs> benefit. Yeah, yeah, I can definitely understand that from my few experiences with golf. Um, but we were we were going to ask you about your golf actually, because I understand that your your brother is also a fairly impressive athlete in his own right, and particularly at golf, um, has has informed me that he's been just been involved in the Australian Open, um, and and I believe you've even caddied for him a few times along the way and stuff. How 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 is that that come along? And do you do you give him any tips when you're out and about, or how's it work? Oh, I'm I'm kind of just there for moral support. Um, <laughs> my advice doesn't go down that well. Uh, I'm just there to sort of yeah try and keep the the mood up and a bit of positivity. Have a joke here and there, but yeah, I've carried for him uh, in Fiji and a few years ago, and the Australian Open the last couple of years. I obviously, I wasn't able to do it. Well, I didn't get the job this year. Um, he flicked me. So, oh, are you kidding? What was he looking yeah. for? <laughs> Who was he after? Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe someone with a bit more of an idea than me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. That's yeah, but I was uh, I was lucky enough to go out and actually watch his last couple of rounds on the Australian Open this year, and he. Yeah. Although he, he didn't finish off as strong as he liked, he still had a pretty good four-day tournament, which is um, good to see. I was pretty proud of him. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And how how do you reckon you've ended up on on such different paths there? Because I, I imagine you would have both played a, a bit of golf together growing up, and, and rugby, and even cricket. How how Did we say what the sort? age difference was? How's it between the two brothers? What is the difference in age? Uh, so he's twenty six, and I'm twenty. I just turned twenty four. So yeah, so. Would have spent a fair bit of the uh, youthful years playing the same sports, wouldn't you? Surely. Yeah. So, body weight wise, he was a bit lighter. So, I think golf was his calling, and um, yeah, he picked it up at a young age. They heavily got him in, involved in golf, and I think he just always had a golf club in his hand. And I was more the as well as either riding motorbikes or getting into getting into mischief in other ways. So. I thought rugby was probably a bit more. <laughs> it's quite impressive that uh, two brothers from the same family develop into elite athletes. What do you think the secret is there? I mean, you might have to ask your family about your upbringing or something. I'm uh, not too sure what the secret is. Um, I'd like to say like we kind of grew up, you know, in central west New South Wales where often, you know, you, know, you sort of get written off a little bit um, coming into, you know, a private school in Brisbane or not the best – I should say you're not at the best private school or something in Brisbane um, and because they usually the GPS schools are the ones that they look for players to you know rugby players and that and I think just yeah that sort of upbringing um, sort of shaped, shaped us and we sort of always knew we had to work hard for anything that we wanted to achieve and um, definitely our parents instilled a lot of hard work. Um, that my old man, he's definitely um, driven a hard work ethic just by the way he's carried out, you know, the way he lives his life, sort of led by his Yeah. And Brad, just with obviously like, you you know, you, you've had to travel interstate for, for your rugby career. Do, you, do your parents still get to get out and, and watch quite a bit of your play? Is there still opportunities for them to uh, to come and see you when, when you are on the park, obviously? 
Yeah, they yeah they're trying to get out as much as they can um, to sort of watch us play our sports, and we're pretty lucky with that. Um, yeah, my parents, if it's a home game in Melbourne, they generally they'll generally be there, so it's good to have their support. And even when I was in Sydney, um, I wasn't too far away from Brisbane, so it was a just an hour flight. It's a little bit longer now. The flights get a little bit more expensive, but um, yeah, I think that. They're always pretty keen to come and watch. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and Brad, if we could just jump back to your rugby for a second, just a, another question that I um, have for you that I find quite interesting. We've obviously spoken plenty about your Im- involvement in the the fifteen man game, um, Super Rugby in particular. But uh, in two thousand fifteen, you you played at the National Rugby Sevens Tournament as well, and you were actually named Player of the Tournament, um, which you were probably aware of again, uh, but just for the <laughs> listeners out there. Um, and uh, obviously, have competed for Australia on the on the World Series sort of circuit as well. So. What are your thoughts on on is there a place for playing both games? Do you enjoy playing rugby sevens as well, um, or is there sort of a, a format that you feel like you're more suited to, or that you enjoy more? Yeah, oh, I definitely think that um, I'm probably a little bit more suited to fifteens now, um, just a little bit heavier, and yeah, you got to be. I got a newfound respect for the sevens players because they're extremely fit blokes and. Uh, incredible athletes and it's just a it's a completely different game but um there is sort of skills that can transfer across to either side so it was a great way for me to sort of start out and um get my first taste of international uh rugby all right so brad you went to iona college where my dad is actually a teacher and has been for a long time did he teach you uh, no, nah, your dad actually didn't teach me. He was, he was grade five. I'm not sure if he's still grade five teacher there, but I I went to Iron in grade eight, so uh, I would right. have missed him. Yeah, so no no yeah. dirt on him. You can dish for us so we can spread, yeah. spread to everyone <laughs> listening. He writes into the podcast every single week, so it would have been nice to <laughs> have something there. Uh, I don't think I have any dirt on him. Um, he, didn't, was, he, didn't, was, he didn't put you under detention or anything in the early days at school? Or? Um. Nah, not that I can recall. I think it was pretty lenient to us boys. Um, that we just because we played with you, Sam. I think he's uh, <laughs> maybe maybe we got away with a few more things than we probably should have. Fair yeah. enough. I can see you being a bit of a teacher's pet anyway back at school. <laughs> but... uh, oh, mate, straight straight grades, you know. <laughs> straight eight grades. <laughs> how, did, how did you go by the end of school? Were you happy with the OP you got, or what do you think? Yeah, I think I was. Um, uh, I think I got a three, OP three. Oh, are you kidding? Very um, impressive. You would be happy with that, wouldn't yeah, you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I, I definitely haven't used it. Um, I, I think I ended up <laughs> enrolled in business, so I uh, definitely didn't require an OP three to get into that course. I, I ended up going into at uni. So, yeah. but I was happy with my uh, school results. It was sort of, it was a fun time working hard. Um, with the studies as well as the sport sort of catch you pretty yeah. pretty on top of things. There is always like that theory, isn't there, in, in Australian culture where, uh, I know, Brad, I'm obviously not going to put words in your mouth here. They're so entirely my views and thoughts. Uh, but I always got told as I was growing up that when rugby league was what, the dumb kids play <laughs> <laughs> rugby, rugby union was what the real intelligent like academic kids played so I mean Brad's OP3 versus uh, Has what did you get well I got an OP2 so that yeah. completely ruins your uh, no, you're, a, you're a cricketer though man. Not a rugby <laughs> league lethal's a rogue league I'm a rugby league what player did you get? OP11 <laughs> so I mean Brad's Brad's performance there has probably just added strength to that argument um, has you almost yeah. also you cut me off with my rugby sevens question, so I still I was very intrigued by rugby sevens. I had one more question for you, Brad. This probably won't yeah. logistically flow that well, but I mean we never really claim to do that anyway on this podcast. Um, so with the, I guess just with the, with the rugby sevens thing, I mean from an attacking point of view, if you're like fast and and quick, it looks like an unbelievable game to play. But then it would just scare me so much from a defensive point of view because I feel like your defensive errors would be highlighted so much because there's no one else to cover you. It's literally just one-on-one tackles and if you miss them, they score. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. And sort of alludes to my point about me being a little bit more suited to the 15 side game now because <laughs> as a forward, um, coming up against guys who can run, you know, 10 seconds flat in 100 metres, it's a bit scary. Um, try, and, try and use... Use your mates like you. It's, 
quotes either side of you to help you as much as you can in that situation and yeah. Um, yeah. cut down their space whenever you can and try not to let them get on the outside of you because it's most likely good night. Well, I know, Brad, that in, in South Africa, they're literally just going to like athletics clubs and just picking sprinters and teaching them how to catch a footy to play rugby seven yeah. so that they become games yeah. at rugby seven. Yeah. yeah. Um, the USA have done that as well. Uh, Perry, Perry Baker and Carl and Isles, I think they're, I came up against those two um, in my debut tournament and thankfully I didn't didn't have to, I didn't get near them or they didn't get near, near, near me with the ball. But yeah, they, they, they were like sprinters back in their day, I think, and just transitioned into rugby and, and they go pretty good at it. Yeah, I've seen plenty of vision of those two guys running down yeah. the side of uh, rugby seven fields. Have you seen much vision of Brad running down the sideline of a <laughs> I'd go close to them. I reckon it'd, it'd be uh, on their on their tail. <laughs> it, just, it would suit your game style. I reckon has a couple of weeks ago we uploaded the video of you playing under tens rugby league where you just ran around the outside of the big pack of players. Yeah, well, that was back in the day. That's what that's what some rugby sevens players look like now. But <laughs> definitely don't have the speed anymore, unfortunately. I think I saw that has that was, that was for the the mud crabs, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we've called yeah, them different red, names, but yeah. down for down Redlands down there, Redlands rugby league. So Do we actually know what the animal is because we've called them lorikeets, parakeets, parrots, and <laughs> mud crabs. <laughs> well, I think the, I don't think they're the mud crabs, unfortunately, Brad. But uh, I think they. I are. thought I must have got, I must have got it wrong. I thought you were playing for Redlands rugby union back in the day, but. Nah, you got nah. Your league. yeah, rugby yeah, league. That's unfortunately, a league man, aren't you? Yeah, rugby league. Yeah, um, that's just disappointing. I, I believe uh, your name in rugby circles is uh, Mummy, and we we like talking about nicknames on the show. So, can you break yeah. that one down for us? <laughs> Who told you that one? <laughs> oh, I think you can take a guess and probably know. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, as we've probably talked about earlier, my injuries. So, I've yeah. Used to take me a bit to get ready for a game. Um, I, I think my shoulders are getting, well, I get both my shoulders strapped and ankles and pretty much everything. I was getting, <laughs> getting taped at one stage. Um, I think I had a cauliflower ear and I was getting ta- taped as well. So, yeah, the, the strapping tape definitely gets a workout. Is it true that cauliflower ear needs draining each week when you're, when you're playing footy? Uh, yeah, so I had one uh, this year which... Uh, yeah, required maybe getting it drained once or twice a week for about two weeks, two or three weeks, and tell you what, that wasn't pleasant. Brad, can you? I know you're not. Well, you got an OP two, but you probably or three, wasn't it? But you're probably not a medical professional. But can you tell us, like, how, why does every rugby player, where every rugby forward have that cauliflower ear? Like, have you had it explained to you? What what does that occur? Um, I believe you can get them. There's a number of different ways you can sort of get them. Um, one's one's just a bit of contact to the the ear, and it sort of compresses the skin, and it creates a gap in the the ear skin and fills up with blood. and And then if you if you're not onto it, it can get really hard and looks pretty nasty. So obviously, I'm trying to keep my ears in as best shape as possible for my my looks so <laughs> getting them trained every, almost every every week yeah mate, but it's, it's not an it's not an issue anymore yeah, but, uh, really? wood. but Lethal we might have so, to get that nickname down to the, the local AFL club the Bombers because I swear there are some there are some blokes that have been playing for probably 45 years and genuinely oh. like, are held together by tape every every particularly in the Resi's team yeah but so right well I remember like when I rolled my ankle last season I was like yeah just go and get it strapped I was like no worries and I was about 14 deep in the line <laughs> there were blokes that were just getting <laughs> strapped left right and centre Brad would be one of those you'd be like oh no I'm behind <laughs> yeah, I'm behind Brad I think I- I've got my own strapping spot for uh, <laughs> for the physios. Yeah, lucky you get your strapping for free now. The the tape, uh, the professional rugby team. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I'd like, yeah. You're right. Wouldn't want to be paying for it myself. Yeah. Well, talking about names, uh, rumor has it you forget people's names more than anyone else. And uh, a source has told me that whenever you're out and about, you're bound to send a text from across the table asking what the person's name is that you're talking to. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'd like to think I'm getting a little bit better, but yeah, it's uh, it's one of my things that I'm not that good at. Brad, maybe that's sort the- of <laughs> listen to one that listen to the name goes in one ear and out the other. 
in one cauliflower ear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Brad, maybe that's the reason we had so many issues with silences at the start. Just every time you forgot our names, you just, <laughs> <laughs> just stop talking. <laughs> Yeah, what are you guys name? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you think you're joking, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, that's right. yeah, not, yeah, not important. It's not a joke. Have <laughs> you got a few tips? Have you you've come up with some ways to uh, to help you out there? Uh, no. Nah, do you guys have any tips? Yeah, Brad, I'll tell you one. Honestly, I'm a I'm a teacher, so I this is quite an important part of my uh, my role at the beginning of the uh at the beginning of the year so i just try and think of a nickname for every single person or like straight away as soon as i as soon as i read through their names on the roll i don't even read out their their actual names i just read out things that are going to help me to remember them and usually make, make like puns out of their last name and stuff and consequently i mean most kids hate me but um <laughs> sometimes that's a uh, just a risk you have to take yeah well i might might take your advice and Try start doing that. Yeah, no, <laughs> correct. Can confirm it's borderline successful at times. <laughs> yeah. The um the same source that told me that has also suggested you love a punt from time to time. Uh, what's what's usually a sport of choice to throw some money at? Has Brad actually worked out who this source is? Does he know? I think. Yeah, he I, I know who this source is. <laughs> <laughs> How's you been um, doing your homework, mate? Yeah. It's a it, it's a quite rich rich source. Um, to, uh, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> So he's a pot kettle black there, but um, actually been pretty good lately. But double in the horse racing, I think, um, especially especially living in Melbourne now, the, the spring racing carnival is pretty cool. You know, it's something that you know everyone's got to get around once in their time, and um, it's quite temptation there with the spring racing carnival in Melbourne. Yeah, fair pretty enough. good fun. Have you had any success, mate, or have you come out in the red? Um. Yeah, definitely in the red this spring carnival. Okay. Yeah, that was a tough one. Very fair. But not too bad, not too bad. Mitch has, sit, Mitch has actually like asked that question pretending that he's interested, Brad, but he's like just so against horse racing as a vegan that he's just like serves you right. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's yeah. not true. There's, there's a bloke in, our, um, in, in my cricket team in second grade that um, reckons he's well, like almost makes a living off of horse racing. He's got a very, a very comfortable full time job too. Is this C Weir? Yeah, what? this is this is Craig Weir. Yeah, if you hadn't, for anyone who hadn't guessed, um, but yeah, he reckons he makes sort of like like up to fifteen grand a year on on betting on horse racing. It's ridiculous, and I just can't understand. Well, I just imagine that surely not many people are doing that. So I thought I'd see sort of which which basket Brad falls into. <laughs> nah, definitely just the casual casual punter more okay. for the the, the, the uh, I guess the. Novelty of it <laughs> when you go to the races. Not the uh, not the second job there. So you don't have to <laughs> declare it on the tax return. Well, apparently, yeah, you nah. Apparently, you don't have to because it because it, it comes under a hobby or something. It's just it's just free money. I don't know, but what I find about those stories is like people are happy to tell you, yeah, I make fifteen grand, but yeah, and re- fail to tell how you how much, much they lose. Yeah. <laughs> 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 they lose per year as well. Probably comes out still with a loss, but well, um, well, Craig's Craig's like full time job is a financial planner, so I'd like to think he's he's. Like on top of it and not lying to me about his funds but you never yeah. know we should also probably be careful with telling everyone he has a gambling addiction as a financial planner for his job <laughs> <laughs> I don't yeah, know okay. if that's, that's exactly who you want to go to for your financial advice very fair we might call that last bit but <laughs> yeah, right. yeah that's right um, Brad I'd Obviously, uh, that's that's probably all the uh, all the questions that we um that we certainly had to ask you. But what we do generally get people to do when we've uh, had the pleasure of interviewing them on this particular podcast is obviously has goes away and does plenty of research, as you've seen, um, to get some dirt on you. Is there anything that you've got uh, in our sort of Sam spam segment? Uh, anything that you'd like to hit has with or the information that you feel like the listeners need to know about uh, about our mate has? Oh. He's put me on the spot here. Um, <laughs> oh, did he not prepare this in the notes that he gave to you? <laughs> no. Oh, I, t- I, told, I told him he'd so have a chance. I told him he'd have a chance to uh, put Trying some stuff on the yeah, too. No, nah, to be honest, uh, I can't really think of anything, to, to be fair. Has he, um, um, did he ever shout your lunch by any chance? <laughs> <laughs> Cause that's been a common theme for every person we've interviewed that has his known. <laughs> No, I don't think he has, or I don't think he's ever got the chance. So maybe, maybe he might have to shout me lunch up in Brisbane when I get up there. Definitely, when you come back up, I'll be doing that. Don't worry, all good. <laughs> yeah, 
fucking cold you see a word there, mate. <laughs> that be a first. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, Brad, that's unreal. We obviously appreciate your time so much, mate, especially when we had so many frustrations early on there uh, in terms of the technology. So thank you very much for sticking with us there. On just um, a bit of a selection issue guys for us uh the regular phone call far better so i really wish yeah. we had to made that transition yeah. earlier yeah. in the piece yeah we've come up strong yeah i haven't had any i haven't had any problems since we switched <laughs> yeah well that's oh, a well. great piece of learning for us thanks brad <laughs> appreciate it and we're sorry that you had to be the uh, experimental project there no it's fine fellas and uh ho- hopefully you got some good stuff there for your listeners no, we do. We've, I've I've just got to make sure that I'm at my strongest point on the uh, editing, and Has will obviously sit there and help me with that. So should be fine. You're not too busy over the next couple of days, are you, Has? Yeah, I'm not sure I can help you out with that one, but... Uh, <laughs> are you going to get Brad some tickets when you're down in Melbourne, when you play down there? Yeah, definitely. Definitely hit him up for some tickets if he wants to watch the cricket, for sure. Well, he might be supportive yeah, for the other team, though. That's <laughs> no uh, nah. Nah, I'm not, nah. No no, no reason to support the Melbourne teams anymore. My cousin's not playing, so... Yeah, very true. Very true. Fantastic, yeah. Brad. Well, um, we'll definitely make sure that that gets sorted out for you, mate. We'll, uh, we'll rewind has for you. Thank you so much for being with us. No, nah, my pleasure. I appreciate it. And thanks for having me on. Cheers. Cheers, mate. Good, one. Good luck with the rehab, right, too. Peter. Look forward to seeing you back yeah. out there. Thank you. All the best, fellas. Bye. Oh, right there, guys, and welcome back. Uh, it's just us now, obviously. We have had to have Brad depart from the phone. It wasn't the greatest phone line, I'll be honest. Uh, but anyway, well done, uh, everyone. Well battled through. Has thank you so much for organising that for us. Uh, my pleasure. It was good to have Brad on and have a chat to him. Fantastic. And obviously uh, a man of, of great uh, character coming back from his third knee reconstruction. So we'll certainly follow that carefully uh, over the next couple of months and, and look forward to seeing him back on the field. Awesome. Okay, thanks. <laughs> thanks for your response there. I <laughs> thought that was a conversation, but obviously not. Um, all right, guys, and, and that is obviously brings us uh, to a close, episode 27. Um, and we obviously still would love to hear from you wherever possible over your Christmas break. Uh, if you have any ideas for us in terms of segments or things that we should talk about uh, or ideas for people that you would like to hear us interview as well that we can approach, uh, send those through to hello at wegotthechocolates.com.au. Um, now, Haz, where else can people get in contact with us? That's the question. Well, plenty of social media platforms there. So Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. I think we're on TikTok now as well. Oh, aren't we ever? So, <laughs> some uh, serious dancers lined I'm up. Still not convinced about that one. But, <laughs> but definitely check out those social media platforms. Yeah. Some stuff there that's just on social media. So uh, so we put out some good content. Lee, you're the master of that. You're the funny guy of the side. So, uh, yeah, thanks for that. Well, that's I've got to bring something. So hopefully that continues <laughs> to be a strong point. That's for sure. Great episode. Thanks yeah, so much, guys. See you, guys. See ya.